Hello, welcome to my course. I'm Masood Raja, and today I'll briefly talk about the excerpt from The Wretched of the Earth uh, by Franz Fanon. And uh, do keep in mind that the excerpt is attached as, a, as, a, as an additional resource to this lecture, so I do encourage you to please read it. And there is already a brief lecture on Fanon himself and his repertoire as a writer and as an activist and a fighter for freedom. Now this particular ex excerpt is from The Wretched of the Earth, which is of course the later work of Fanon. And it's radically different from black skin, white masks. And here in this part, as you read it, you will see that he's trying to tackle the question of decolonization itself, right? What is decolonization? How does it come to be? What does it aspire to? What must it erase, right? And what is he, what he's talking about is, is that the colonial relationship, according to Fanon, is this binaristic relationship. Now keep in mind he's writing with the context of Algeria in mind. And there is this binary power structure of the native and the settler, the European settler. And at, there's a moment in, in this excerpt where he says that the sec settler is the one who created the native. Now by that we don't mean is that, that the native didn't exist before the settlers came in, but the idea that before the settlers came in, the natives were the people of that land. It's that binary structure that colonialism establishes because of which the figure of native as native emerges. But there is another problem in that relationship, and that is that settlers' own existence depends upon the system put in place by the colonizers. Right? So their sympathies, therefore, will always be with the metropolitan culture. Then there is a spatial dimension to their existence within the colonies. Right? Spatially, if you look at how space is organized, the settlers live in the European part of the town, which in, you know, in even India and Pakistan, we still call them cantonments, right? These are the places that are organized. They, they have substantial, strong buildings, wide streets, right? Tree-lined streets. And juxtaposed against that is the Kaspa, the native town, right, which has never been developed, which is overcrowded, doesn't have a good sanitation system, is probably not secure. And that system, of course, it comes to be because of the existence of this power dynamic. And what it also does is during the last stages of decolonial movement, right, it becomes the place of desire. This is the place that the native desires. And in order to have it, he must literally oust the settler, right? That's the fight that he's talking about. Then Fanon is also talking about in this excerpt is the nature of decolonial movement. It cannot be talking your way to freedom. What he says is that since the system was established through violences, right, through the colonial violence, the native knows that and the native must overthrow the colonizer through force. And in the process, in that revolutionary movement, another thing happens. The people, the natives who were standing on the fringes of it, they come and join the movement too. Another thing that we learn from this excerpt, that the decolonial movement cannot be driven top down. It's a movement to oust the established order in which he says the least shall become the most right. Since it is driven by those who have been kept outside the prom hegemonic promise of the colonial system, it's their hopes and aspirations that drive it. Everyone else joins those. So when actual decolonization happens, it's a total alteration of the system, right? Replacement of the dominant group by the most silenced and sidelined group. That's the decolonial movement. In the process, he also talks about a certain stage in colonial history where the natives become aware of the hypocrisy of their European masters, 
right? I mean, in the beginning, maybe they were overwhelmed by force. Maybe some of them bought into the idea, we bring light, we bring science, we bring civilization to you. But towards the end of an anti-colonial movement, in the decolonial moment, that mask is lifted, right? And the natives fighting for their own freedom can see very clearly the hypocrisy of European claims. So every time a European leader comes up and says, we are pious and we liberated you, they listen to them, but they already are preparing for battle, preparing to fight the system. And that moment we must always reach in any anti-colonial movement where the natives realize that all these narratives and stories are there to perpetuate the system in which the colonizers exist. Now, of course, there are deeper systems than that. The educational system played a huge role in it. I will soon record a lecture on Ngugi Chiango's take on that, decolonizing the African mind. But more importantly, a native elite is also created, right, who, who side with the colonizers. But in this excerpt then, what Fanon is suggesting is that everything changes. The mere question of colonial hegemony comes under, you know, challenge. And towards the end of this excerpt, he's talking about the negritude movement, right? And I will uh, record a lecture on that too. But what's happening is that the writers of negritude are not necessarily just national. They are a global presence. So he names so many of them from Africa, some from America, right, which hadn't yet won the civil rights there. And what he's saying is all of these people have recovered, right, their African identity. And they are mobilizing now in their poetry the voices of their people. Right? Remember, in another part of the same book, Fanon lays down three stages of the native writing, right? In the first stage, the natives try to write like Europeans, right? Um, if you want to see the examples, look at the early English writers like R.K. Narayan in India and others in Africa. But then in the second stage, the native writers and poets go and, and retrieve the folk tales, the folk art. They start writing about that in opposition to the European dominant forms of art, right? And it is in the third stage, he says, where the native poet writes, you know, a sentence that captures the heart of the people when they write in solidarity with their people. And he's saying in the decolonial moment, the negritude movement has already reached a point where there is a body of work. There are authors, African, in origin or from continent of Africa, who are siding with the people and writing with the people. And that is also part of decolonization. So overall, this essay, in one way or the other, points to the binary structure of the settler colonialism, right, and the native relationships, based in his experience in Algeria. And then the question of spatiality of colonial space in which the, col the colonizers part of the town is always better supplied and better uh, built, right? And what kind of a binary spatial structure of desire does it generate? And that decolonialism is the aim and attempt to replace the existing order with a new order, right? Now, this is slightly besides the point, but the question then arises is are, are the natives still working within the same logic of self-forming, right? That if they are oppressed, they must now become like the oppressors. That's a question that Fanon doesn't answer, even though he does answer it in Black Skin, White Masks, where he talks about forgiveness and creating a more universal humanism. But if you really want an answer to that question, how not to function within the logic that the colonizers have created of power in which your desire becomes to be like them, the best place to start is to read, um, you know, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And if you're interested, I have a whole range of lectures on it on my YouTube channel, so please go and watch them. But for right now, these are some of my thoughts on this excerpt. Uh, as I mentioned, the excerpt is uploaded 
as an extra resource under this lecture, and I do encourage you to read it. And if you have any questions about this excerpt or, or generally about Fanon, please feel free to contact me, and I'll be happy to answer that. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time in the next lesson.